Danny comes to us, well, from a long past of many things, but the ones I'm going to highlight are uh, he's a, a assistant director of the Middle East and North African Studies Program at Northwestern. Um, he manages and develops the, um, it's called MENA, I guess, uh, programs, efforts in public engagement and outreach, uh, with it, including its web and social media presence, and new projects and, and initiatives. Um, he produces a series of inter video interviews with leading scholars, artists, and writers, uh, and coordinates a number of events, some of which sounded very interesting, and I don't know, I'm assuming they're open to the public, but maybe people will ask about that later. Um, before joining MENA in, 19, in November 2016, he was the Associate Director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver um, and is the author of a number of books and a number of online of um, op-eds in, in uh, the New York Times and other media. Uh, he's also, I thought was cool, was also an online editor of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which feels sort of 20th century at this point, but the fact that it was an online editor, I guess, yeah. Uh, anyway, um, without more, um, I just want to introduce um, Danny Bavia. Uh, oh, I bumped his computer. We're going to have a quick little video that he sub that he thought might help set this up a little bit. So if we're going to have 30 seconds from a little video he sent us, and then he'll come speak. Why has the Middle East seen such a dramatic rise in sectarian conflict over the last several years? The new conventional wisdom in Western capitals and media circles attributes this development to sheer branches of Islam. According to this view, sectarianism is a primordial force that explains all the region's present ills. Those people have always hated one another. That's just how they are. Sectarian violence is thus intractable. A new book, Sectarianization, Mapping the New Politics of the Middle East, edited by Nada Hashimi and Danny Postal, challenges this new conventional wisdom. And Thank you so much uh, for that very generous introduction. And, okay. What do we do to get the PowerPoint back on the screen? Um, okay. Well, thank you very much for that very generous introduction, Katie. I appreciate it. It's very good uh, to be here at the Ethical Humanist Society in particular, uh, where I've been an interloper uh, over the years. Some of you might recognize me as just uh, from the crowd. I, I, I've attended numerous events here. Um, some before uh, my departure for Denver in the fall of 2012, and then a few since. Um, and <clears throat> I was going to say that if you saw that slide that we'll hopefully we'll have back up in a moment of the, the New Humanist magazine. Um, there we go. Wait. So I'm particularly honored uh, to be present here uh, with you at the Ethical Humanist Society today, not only to talk about the uh, politics of the Middle East, but because I uh, myself have a bit of a history with humanism. Um, the, uh, the British magazine, New Humanist, I don't think it's as well known on this side of the Atlantic. It's, it's the kind of the British equivalent of the humanist magazine here in the U.S. Um, it's one of the uh, oldest uh, humanist publications in Europe. Uh, I have had the pleasure of writing several articles for this magazine, The New Humanist. In fact, in 2009, uh, a very personal essay that I wrote about the anxieties of being a humanist father uh, whose children attend Catholic Church with their very religious mother, um, that became, I was really thrilled about this, it became the most uh, widely read and circulated uh, article in the history of The New Humanist magazine. So if you'd like to talk about that in a separate context, I would be thrilled to do that. That's almost 10 years ago now. So, um, But in any case, my point was just to uh, explain that I do actually have a very, um, a very uh, personal connection to humanism and have written for humanist publications, and I'm thrilled to be here amongst fellow humanists this morning. So thanks for being here to hear um, about my recent work on the U.S., 
Saudi-Iranian rivalry. And I should say up front that this is not a term that I myself have coined. Everyone talks about the Saudi-Iranian rivalry, but it was the International Crisis Group earlier this year that coined this particular formulation of the U.S.-Saudi-Iranian rivalry, which I think is a very important way of framing the issue. It underscores that, yes, it's a regional rivalry within the Middle East between the two major hegemons, hegemonic powers in the region, Saudi Arabia and Iran. But the United States is deeply implicated in this rivalry at every step of the way. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with the International Crisis Group, it's, it's an outstanding think tank and research organization in Europe that issues um, a number of reports and policy briefs um, about various conflicts around the world. At the beginning of every year, it puts out this list of 10 conflicts to watch in the coming year. And in January of 2018, so at the beginning of this year, uh, whose end we are now approaching, it put on its list of the 10 hottest conflicts, the most volatile uh, conflicts on planet Earth, number two, only second to the North Korean standoff, which you don't even hear that much about anymore, number two on its list for 2018 was what it called the U.S.-Saudi-Iranian rivalry, and it explained it by saying that this rivalry will likely eclipse other Middle Eastern fault lines in 2018. It is enabled and exacerbated by three parallel developments, the consolidation of the authority of Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, Saudi Arabia's assertive crown prince, to put it mildly, the Trump administration's more aggressive strategy toward Iran, and that was before, by the way, uh, the, the, uh, the Trump administration announced that it would be scrapping or withdrawing from the Iran nuclear deal, which I'll be discussing soon, and the end of the Islamic State's territorial control in Iraq and Syria, which allows Washington and Riyadh to aim the spotlight more firmly on Iran. How prescient that the International Crisis Group should have identified this precise constellation of forces at the beginning of 2018, given what has happened over the last several months. And that's what I'd like to discuss with you today. So the little video that you saw about our new book on sectarianization um, pointed to the fact that there's this new narrative that has taken hold in Western capitals and media and policy circles. This kind of new conventional wisdom that sees all of the conflicts taking place across the Middle East today as deriving from one central force, which is this notion of ancient hatreds. It's all to do with these battles that go back to the very beginning of Islam itself. So there are various versions of this new conventional wisdom. One is what I call the sort of centrist establishment punditocracy version. And who could represent the centrist establishment punditocracy better than Tom Friedman, who wrote that the main issue in Yemen today is the seventh century struggle over who is the rightful heir to the Prophet Muhammad, Shiites or Sunnis. And as I'll demonstrate over the course of the next few minutes, this is a, an incredibly simplistic, shallow, and distorted reading of what's going on in the Middle East today. But this is a, a very, I think, um, salient uh, illustration of this new conventional wisdom at work. Looking at Yemen today, an incredibly complicated conflict in which there are multiple forces and factors at work and reducing it all to the seventh century struggle over um, Islamic, uh, uh, you know, who, who should be uh, the leader of the Islamic world. Now, former President Obama in his final State of the Union address actually said something pretty similar. He said the Middle East is going through a transformation that will play out for a generation rooted in conflicts that date back millennia. Now, if I were a teacher, I would say, who in the class can, ex can tell us what is the first and foremost error in this statement? Very basic problem <laughs> of fact in this statement. 
Well, the, the, the good fact checkers at the Washington Post within hours of this speech pointed out that uh, it, it's not possible, factually speaking, for conflicts in is the Islamic world to date back millennia because Islam itself is less than a millennium and a half. Well, it's approximately a, a millennium and a half old, right? So using the term millennia is quite misleading. Even, even as Friedman tried to do, to date the conflict back centuries is problematic. But to say millennia is just factually prima facie incorrect, counterfactual. And as this uh, Washington Post uh, uh, piece pointed out, some of these conflicts don't even date back a decade, and that's exactly what I'll be discussing. Now, having said that, I'm not trying to pick on former President Obama as such. And in, in fact, in this, at this particular moment, I think a lot of people, both Americans and people around the world, have a certain kind of nostalgia given the current occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, my, my point is not really so much to focus on Obama as such in this instance, but to point out that even someone as thoughtful and well-read and intellectually sophisticated as Barack Obama fell prey to this very shallow, problematic, conventional wisdom reducing everything to sectarianism. Now there's a very, a much more vulgar right-wing version of this conventional wisdom. Um, Bill O'Reilly, who fortunately no longer has uh, his uh, perch at Fox Noise, although he's been replaced by an equally sordid character in Tucker Carlson. That's another discussion. But Bill O'Reilly said, this was at the height of the, um, when the occupation of Iraq in 2004, 5, 6 was going particularly badly. Um, a lot of right-wing commentators and pundits like O'Reilly we're trying to make sense of it. You know, these were people who championed the Iraq war, right? And they were upset. What's wrong with these Iraqis? We came to liberate them. We offered them these gifts of freedom. And all they're doing is, you know, uh, uh, stirring up religious violence and, 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 and creating an insurgency against us. They don't, they don't appreciate our, you know, our, our, our magnanimity in liberating them. So at a certain point, it was very interesting to watch the way people on the right and champions of the Iraq war tried to make sense of this. And, and they turned to this sectarian argument. So Bill O'Reilly says at one point, in Iraq, the Sunni and Shia want to kill each other. They want to blow each other up. They want to torture each other. They have fun. They like this. This is what Allah tells them to do, and that's what they do. And again, this is around 2006, I believe, that he said this on his radio show. And if, if you look back, 2006, that was the height of sectarian violence in Iraq, uh, of re sectarian reprisals and attacks on mosques and the like. Um, so there's this right-wing, much more vulgar version of the sectarian argument. And there's also a left-wing version of it. Um, again, this is someone who's more popular on the other side of the pond, Patrick Coburn is a veteran journalist, Middle East correspondent for the British newspaper, The Independent. But he's pretty well known. This particular photo uh, comes from an interview he gave to the uh, very popular program, Democracy Now! Um, he's a frequent guest there. And his uh, work is often circulated uh, in the leftosphere uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, his brother, Alexander Coburn, his late brother, Alex Coburn, is, is perhaps well better known on this side uh, in the United States because he lived here for, very, for quite a long time. But Patrick Coburn uh, is, has a, this might seem strange to imagine that, that, that certain people on the left would subscribe to this sectarian view of the Middle East, this reductionist, uh, simplistic argument that it's all about Sunni and Shia. Um, I don't have time to go into detail about Coburn's views on this, but I've written a piece about it called uh, Left-Wing Orientalism, The Curious Case of Patrick Coburn. And if you're interested, you can find that if you just Google it, or I'd be happy to discuss it in the Q&A. So my point is that there are various iterations of this new conventional wisdom, this sectarian, essentialist, 
narrative, that it's all about sectarianism. But there's a problem with all of these versions of the argument, whether they come from the center establishment, the left, or the right. And the problem is what the um, uh, Middle East expert Shadi Hamid, pictured here, calls the temporal problem. There's a temporal problem, he writes, with the ancient hatreds thesis. And it applies just as much to Syria or Lebanon today as it did to the Balkans in the 1990s. If there is something constant about a culture and its predisposition to violence, then how can we explain stark variations in civil conflict over short periods of time? Now, in some ways, you might say this is the sociology of the obvious. It seems perfectly you know, self-evident what Shadi Hamid is saying here. And yet, I think that this point gets to the very core, the very core of what's wrong with this new sectarian narrative. And I'm going to try to illustrate exactly what he uh, had in mind with this temporal problem by just going back 12 years to 2006. It's almost inconceivable from the vantage point of 2018 now to imagine that in the summer of 2006, the two most popular figures in the Arab world were these two. Um, you might recognize the one on your uh, left better than the one on your right or vice versa, depending on your familiarity with the region. But what's really striking about this is that neither of these two gentlemen is a Sunni Muslim. They are both Shiites. One is an Arab and one is not. Okay, that's Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, and Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who was then president of the Islamic Republic of Iran, now former president. And in the summer of 2006, according to Arab public opinion polls across the region, these were the two men who had the most favorability, the highest popularity in the, in the mind you, Sunni majority uh, Arab Islamic world. Two Shiites, one not even an Arab. Why is this so striking from the vantage point of point of 2018, because through the sectarianization process that I'll be describing in, 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 a, in, in a little while, through the sectarianization process, it's almost inconceivable to imagine that two uh, non-Sunnis, two Shiites, one not even an Arab, one is a Persian, would, would, would have such favorability, such popularity, given the sectarianized political landscape of the Middle East today. So what happened? The obvious question is, what, ha what changed between 2006 and 2018? And in a word, what changed is Syria. The Syrian conflict changed everything in terms of the regional politics of sectarianism in the Middle East. So what's wrong with this sectarian narrative, this notion that we can understand all of the violence and conflict across the Middle East today by reference to these pr presumably trans-historical, constant, immutable forces, these primordial passions that r are rooted in religious identity. What's wrong with this view? It's a, it's a perfect illustration of what some critics have called reading history backwards. That is to say, you look at what's happening right now, you see violence, you see conflict. Much of the violence in the Middle East today is indeed framed not only by Western pundits and politicians, but even by the local actors themselves in the Middle East, in Syria, in Iraq. Much of the violence is framed in sectarian terms, right? And so we see this and we say, well, obviously it's just always been about these sectarian differences because they go back to the seventh century. The Sunni-Shia split starts in the seventh century very early in Islamic history. And so since that split starts in the seventh century and since the actors in the Middle East today are killing one another about, or they seem to be killing each other about the, over these differences, therefore that explains everything, right? Well, this is a case of reading history backwards, projecting present circumstances back over time. And it's a huge fallacy. And it has consequences. In the 1990s, we saw a different version of this with another pundit, very much a sort of Thomas Friedman type uh, sage of conventional wisdom and court pundit. 
uh, by the name of Robert Kaplan, who wrote this book called Balkan Ghosts. When Yugoslavia was coming apart and you had the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, uh, you, uh, Robert Kaplan uh, rushed to the stage of world opinion to say, this is dated, this dates back to ancient blood feuds and ethnic hatreds that have been in the Balkans for centuries. This goes back so far, and, and there was this sort of aura about Kaplan because, you know, especially in a country like the United States where our historical memory is uh, approximately the length of a news cycle, which is getting shorter and shorter. Um, when someone offers an analysis of current affairs that goes back centuries and they're very articulate like Kaplan is, it has this kind of um, magic spell that it casts on us like, oh my God, this guy is deep. Oh, it goes back centuries. Well, Bill Clinton actually fell under the spell of Robert Kaplan. Not only did he read the book Balkan Ghosts, he assigned it to most of his staff and his foreign policy uh, shop, and he said, you've got to read this book. And he gave a number of interviews uh, in the media over several, over a number of years of his presidency saying, look, there's nothing we can do about the Balkans. These people hate each other. They've always hated each other. It's all in Robert Kaplan's book. End of story. They just, you know, they just, the blood just has to, it just has to flow until it stops. Now, eventually, Clinton actually came to a very different view on this. But the po my point in raising this is that these ideas, these narratives, these arguments matter. They have a direct influence on presidents, on prime ministers, on foreign ministers, on policymakers across the world. They even have an influence on local actors. And it really matters when you get history bloody wrong. The irony of these historical, quote unquote, I'm putting scare quotes around historical, these arguments that invoke history, that go back centuries to try to explain current affairs, the irony is they sound very profound because, oh my God, this guy can tell us what was going on in the 14th century and the 7th century. Oh my God, he really knows his stuff. But the irony is these are incredibly superficial ahistorical arguments that reduce history to a single causal force and that are in fact deeply counterfactual and problematic. So this is essentially um, what we argue in the book Sectarianization as that uh, little video uh, uh, pointed to. And what I'm going to uh, do in the next few minutes is to just explain very briefly what we try to argue. What is our alternative argument to this new conventional wisdom that reduces everything to sectarian hatreds that supposedly go back centuries? The sectarianization thesis, as we call it in the book, emphasizes that the intensification of sectarian violence and conflict in the Middle East is a process that in fact does exactly what Shadi Hamid uh, pointed to. These are very stark variations over very short periods of time. So in other words, if, if Sunni and Shia have always hated each other and that's why they're killing each other today, why have there been vast stretches of history in which they don't kill each other, in which there's coexistence, intermarriage, all sorts of uh, uh, nonviolent periods of history. Why now, in other words? The question we ask is, why is there such a spike in sectarian violence in the Middle East now at this moment? That's the sectarianization process is driven, we argue, by political forces, regimes, dictators, individuals, sectarian entrepreneurs who are pursuing agendas to do fundamentally with power, not theology. And the process is one that involves the mobilization, the manipulation, the instrumentalization of identities. Sunni Shia in this case, but we can all relate to this, right? This is not exclusive to the Middle East. The manipulation of popular sentiments and identities is something I think that speaks to our current situation in the United States, in Europe, with the rise of populist authoritarian uh, characters, whether it's Trump, Viktor Orban, uh, Duterte, Erdogan, Bolsonaro now in Brazil. It's about scapegoating. It's about demonization of the other. It's fundamentally about what the late historian Peter Gay, not a scholar of the Middle East, an historian of Europe, 
But Peter Gay called this the cultivation of hatred. I think that's a very apt term. He was describing the rise of European nationalism in the 19th and early 20th centuries. But this is exactly what the sectarianization process is all about. It's about the cultivation of hatred. Hatred, as, as we all know, is not something that people are born with. It's something that's learned or cultivated. And this is exactly what's happening in the Middle East today. Now, not to get too fancy or academic, but there are various vectors, we might call them, of the sectarianization process. It's not a one-way street. There's top-down sectarianization, which I'll give you a couple of, of examples of where regimes generate sectarian narratives and sectarianize conflicts for their own strategic self-interest. There's bottom-up sectarianization, where you have popular forces actually driving the sectarianization process, or imams, religious leaders, civil society activists, sectarian entrepreneurs from the grassroots. You have outside-in sectarianization, which is fueled by regional forces. So, for example, Iraqi you know, sectarians, ISIS, showing up in Syria and pushing the Syrian conflict in a particular direction. And you have inside out. If you look at that same exact thing I just described from the opposite point of view. So from an Iraqi point of view, you have these, these various characters um, who are then spreading the conflict that starts in Iraq out across the region into other into other areas. And so sectarianization is a multi-directional, omnidirectional phenomenon. The core, I would argue, the core of the sectarianization process today revolves around the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. This is the centerpiece. It's not the only, okay? There are other factors. In many, in many of the conflicts in the Middle East today, you have to understand, for example, the Yemeni conflict fundamentally in Yemeni terms. Yes, Saudi Arabia plays a huge role in it. Um, in, in, in the case of Syria, uh, uh, Iran plays a huge role, and I'll be talking about those cases in a minute. There are local forces that must be understood, regional forces, but at the core of the general regional process of sectarianization, we find the Saudi-Iranian rivalry. But again, in the popular narrative, we are told that the Saudi-Iranian rivalry is just this primordial, fundamental, immovable, these two countries, one is Sunni, one is Shia, so they just hate each other. But it hasn't always been that way. So what we argue in the book is that the, it's basically a recent phenomenon, this sec, not sectarianism, not sectarian identities. Those go, do indeed go back centuries. But the sectarianization of politics, that is to say, people mobilizing politically, thinking of their political subjectivity, agency, in sectarian terms. This is a very recent phenomenon that essentially goes back to 1979. The three key years in the sectarianization process are 1979, 2003, and 2011. And I'm very briefly going to uh, explain why those three years. But before I do, I mean, just to go back to before 1979, Iran and Saudi Arabia were on very good terms. They enjoyed very cordial and friendly relations. Here's a picture of the Shah and, uh, and the king of Saudi Arabia. They were on the same side of some of the key defining conflicts of the region. In the 1960s, for example, in a previous iteration of the Yemen War, you had a, throughout the 1960s, the Yemen War was not only important to Yemen, it was actually a regional conflict, again, like it is today, in the 1960s. But what's so interesting about that Yemeni conflict, very complicated conflict, to be sure, but from a regional point of view, what's so uh, salient about it is that the way international players and regional states aligned around the Yemeni conflict had absolutely nothing to do with sect or religion at all, unlike today. It had to do with regime type um, or ideo ideological, Cold War alliances, ideological form formations. So there was a coup in 1962 against the king, the monarch of Yemen, who ruled from 1948 to 1962. And this new Yemen Arab Republic, uh, otherwise known as North Yemen, is declared. So how did the regional forces align? Egypt, which at the time was led by Gamal Abdel Nasser, the leader of the sort of 
Arab nationalist, pan-Arabist movement um, supported its fellow Republicans, okay? Its fellow anti-monarchists. And on the other side were Saudi Arabia and Iran together allied along with other monarchies like Jordan supporting, guess who? Their fellow monarchs, the royalists in Yemen, the deposed king. And so you see what defined this conflict had nothing to do with sects, Sunni versus Shia. It wasn't about Islam. It was about regime type, that is to say, monarchy versus Republican. It was about ideological forces in the region and Cold War alliances. 1979, of course, changes all of this. The Iranian Revolution happens. But it's very important to remember that although now we think of the Iranian Revolution, a lot of people call it the Islamic Revolution in Iran, which I think is a misnomer. It was really an Iranian revolution. It was a popular revolution that was partly to do with Islam, but it was also about a lot of other things. It was about poverty. It was about anti-imperialism. It was about a rejection of the uh, monarchy, which was pro-Western, which was very much a puppet of the United States. And it, so it's important to remember that although the uh, ideological grandfather of the revolution, Ayatollah Khomeini, was a, uh, w w very much thought of the revolution as a Shia theological revolution. He had a theological argument, in other words. Nonetheless, in the region, the Iranian revolution reverberated across the region amongst many non-Shia. I mean, the majority of uh, the Arab world is non-Shia. Shia are about 10 to 15 percent of the population of the Islamic world. And uh, the, the, the Iranian revolution resonated deeply with many uh, Arab Sunnis, with many atheists, with many Christian Arabs, with many secular forces in the region. Again, because it was not just about religion, it was about popular mobilization, uh, re social revolution, rejection of monarchy, anti-imperialism, etc. And this freaked Saudi, Saudi Arabia out big time. And you see a massive spike Okay, what, in other words, what freaked Saudi Arabia out about the Iranian revolution wasn't just that it was a Shia uh, uprising. It was that it was a popular uprising against monarchy because they are a monarchy with a very shaky form of legitimacy. And their own shaky form of legitimacy was challenged not only from Iran but also from within. In 1979, a group of radical students in Saudi Arabia laid siege to the uh, Grand Mosque of Mecca. And this continues to ha haunt Saudi Arabia deeply. So Saudi Arabia had a regional crisis in the form of the Iranian Revolution. It had its own internal crisis of legitimacy with, the, with this uh, takeover of the Grand Mosque. And these people, these students, were arguing essentially that, that the monarchy, that, they, that the ruling, fa the royal family of Saudi Arabia was illegitimate and should be overthrown. Of course, they were repressed. Saudi Arabia is very skilled in the business of repression, but ultimately this continues to haunt Saudi Arabia and its policies over the course of the 1980s reflect this deep crisis, this total freakout about the Iranian revolution and the larger wave of anti-monarchy, anti-dictatorship in the region. However, the other big fact of the 1980s is that Saddam Hussein immediately invades Iran shortly after the revolution and fights a, an incredibly bloody war. It was actually the second bloodiest land war of the 20th century after World War II. Largely forgotten, very rarely discussed anymore. And the reason I mention it now is that the Saudi-Iranian rivalry is playing out indirectly by proxy here. Saudi Arabia strongly supports Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran for different reasons. So Saudi Arabia has its own sectarian narrative, right? Saddam Hussein did not invade Iran in explicitly sectarian terms. He did not rule Iraq as a Sunni leader, although he came from a Sunni family. He ruled in the name of this Baathist ideology as a secular nationalist, supposedly. But the point is that regionally, the major forces, Saudi Arabia, the Sunni Gulf monarchies, and other Sunni states in the region strongly supported Saddam's invasion of Iran in sectarian terms to push back against what they saw as this Shia revolutionary force that, was, that had appeal to their own Sunni subjects. 
The other major story of the 1980s, of course, is the Soviet slash Russian invasion of Afghanistan and the, um, the mobilization of thousands of young jihadi Muslims from all over the world, particularly uh, from the Arab world, to fight in Afghanistan, most famously Osama bin Laden, who becomes a, an ally of the United States in that battle. And the reason this is important is uh, in terms of the Saudi-Iranian rivalry and the story of sectarianization, is that at the time, these uh, jihadis were focused on defeating the Soviet Union, an atheist, communist uh, empire. They weren't focused on sectarianism per se, but this morphs into this battle that Fawaz Gerges, uh, the scholar uh, at the London School of Economics, um, in his book, The Far Enemy, he talks about the distinction amongst jihadis, this huge debate between attacking the near enemy and the far enemy. So for Al-Qaeda, for Osama bin Laden, the key is to fight the far enemy. In the case of Afghanistan, that was the Soviet Union. In the case later, over the 1990s, he focuses his uh, ire on the United States. These are the far enemies, right? There's another argument within the jihadi world that no, 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 the far enemy, they're not going to be around that long. We, we got rid of them. They left Afghanistan. The Americans are in Iraq. They're going to be gone pretty soon. Forget about the far enemy. They're only here for a little while. They don't have a deep investment in the region. The real enemy that we have to go, go after is the near enemy. And who's the near enemy? Iran and the Shiites. Those are the people. So this guy here, Zarqawi, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, who's a Jordanian, very much a, a transnational sectarian entrepreneur, a, a, a jihadi for hire, soldier of fortune, goes from one conflict to another, tracing the trajectory of jihadism over these decades from 1979 to the present, where they go from one conflict to another. They start in Afghanistan. That's really the crucible. Then they go to Chechnya. Then they go to Bosnia. Then they go to Iraq. So Zarqawi shows up in Iraq shortly after the U.S. invasion, and he immediately breaks with al-Qaeda over this question. Al-Qaeda wants to stop the Americans, and Zarqawi says, forget about the Americans. They'll be gone soon. We have to stop the Shiites, and he starts blowing up Shia mosques all over Iraq. This is a huge divide. This is one of the defining differences between al-Qaeda and ISIS is exactly over this question, and it's a huge part of the story of sectarianization. So again, sectarianization sometimes happens from the regime level. Sometimes it happens, it's pushed and driven by characters like Zarqawi. Now, in the 1990s, there's basically a cold peace between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And I mention this, again, just to remind us that things can change very quickly. There's reconstruction after the Iran-Iraq war. It's the end of the Cold War internationally. Things are changing. Saudi Arabia and Iran are basically not at each other's throats very much at all. And this all changes in 2003, and we all know what happened then. Saddam Hussein is toppled. This is a huge story for, for Iraq itself, of course, because it goes from being ruled in the name of a sort of secular nationalist ideology, Baathism, but basically, from a sectarian point of view, Saddam is a, belongs to the minority Sunni community in Iraq, right? He's not ruling in the name of Sunni Islam, but he comes from a Sunni background. He is seen by the Shia majority uh, of Iraqis as a Sunni, or as principally as, as, as a tyrant and, and the, the head of a, a sadistic torture state. Nonetheless, he, it's minority rule. After 2003... Saddam is toppled, and you have Shia majority rule. Iran is very happy about this. Iran benefits enormously from both of the major U.S. invasions of the period. 2001, the Taliban is knocked out. That was one of Iran's two biggest enemies. 2003, Saddam Hussein is knocked out. That was the second biggest enemy. Actually, the number that, Saddam was the number one enemy of Iran. The Taliban was the number two. So it, on its east and on its west, its two major enemies are knocked out by its other enemy, the United States. But it ironically benefits Iran enormously. And it starts freaking out the region. It starts freaking out the region, not just Saudi Arabia, but other Sunni states. So King Abdullah of Jordan, who's often described as a kind of moderate, he's beloved in, we in Western media circles, his English is so beautiful, he seems so educated... 
It was none other than King Abdullah who in 2004, shortly after the U.S. invasion of Iraq, starts talking about a Shia crescent. This term Shia crescent starts getting popularized. People start talking about a Shia corridor. There's this rolling thunder. Iran is on the move. See, what really freaks out Saudi Arabia and its Sunni allies about the, you, the removal of Saddam Hussein, who they didn't love, but they freak out because it's one thing for Iran to have a Shia-led state because they're not even Arabs. They're Persians. They're different. They, that, that, they, can, do, they can do Shiism in their territory, but now you've brought a Shia majority government to an Arab state in Iraq, and that's a line too far. And so you start getting this panic region-wide panic about a Shia crescent, a Shia corridor, a Persian invasion on the move. The Saudis actually um, ask Obama. They plead with Obama in 2008 to cut off the head of the snake, as they called it. They, you start seeing this language where Saudis are now referring, Saudis and, and other Sunni states are referring to uh, the Iranians and to Shiite Muslims in general as snakes, as vermin. They're not real Muslims. There's this whole interesting shift in language, whereas before they were viewed as sort of heretical Muslims. Now, in a lot of Sunni discourse, they're not Muslims at all. This is a, 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 a total perversion. This is a, some sort of other religion. It's a Persian Zoroastrian conspiracy that has nothing to do with Islam. And so we've got to stop them. And so you see Saudi Arabia pushing uh, the Obama administration pushing Washington very much to invade or bomb or attack or cut off Iran. Now, for its part, Iran is not helping in this war of narratives in the region. So this gentleman, Ali Reza Zakhani, who was a member of the Iranian parliament and a very close advisor to Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, he gives a speech in which he talks about three Arab capitals, Damascus, Beirut, and Baghdad have today ended up in the hands of Iran and belong to the Iranian Islamic Revolution, and Sana'a in Yemen will soon follow. And this quote, this unfortunate quote, gets picked up all over the region. It feeds the most paranoid fantasies of the sectarian Sunni narrative, the, the sectarian narrative that the Sunni states are promoting. You see the Iranians admit it themselves. They're trying to take over the Arab world. And so you have uh, uh, MBS in his early days saying that is, Iran is trying to control the entire Islamic world, not just its own uh, immediate sphere of influence or Shia majority countries, but actually the entire Islamic world. And then the figure of uh, uh, Qasem Soleimani becomes really this kind of symbolic, uh, I would say, uh, t takes on enormous symbolic significance. Soleimani is the head of the Al-Quds Brigade of the Iranian Islamic Revolutionary Guards. The Al-Quds Brigade is responsible for what is euphemistically called extraterritorial operations. That is to say, Iran's military adventures outside of its own borders in Syria, in Lebanon, etc. And this character of Soleimani becomes this spectral figure in the Sunni Arab world, this menacing, monstrous character who's trying to take over and promote a Shia agenda, an Iranian agenda, expansionism. The third year, this is the final chapter of the story, is 2011. Now this is very important because of course you have these Arab uprisings. And again, going back to what I said about reading history backwards, you have now, from the vantage point of 2016, 17, 18, you have a lot of pundits rewriting history, saying, well, of course, the Arab Spring was a total disaster. It was the reason that we have so much sectarian violence and war in the region is because of these uprisings. If only we could get the dictators back, bring back Saddam, bring back Gaddafi. I mean, this is really the argument. Uh, Trump obviously misses the dictators, and those who are still around are his best friends. But he really, really laments, and many realpolitik conservative uh, diplomats and politicians really miss the old order of the strong men because we can do business with them. They kept a lid on these crazy passions, these religious 
you know, forces, as soon as you unleash them, as soon as people take to the street and remove the dictator, look what happens. This is a totally oversimplistic, distorted reading of what happened in 2011. The most, it's very important to remember that the uprisings themselves had nothing to do with sectarianism. Let me say that again. The Arab uprisings that began in December 2010 in Tunisia and spread across the region in 2011 had nothing to do with sectarianism. They had to do with what were the slogans. Just look at the slogans and the demands of the protesters in the streets. They were for bread, social justice, democratic rights, human dignity, the end of dictatorship. Not a single word about sect. In fact, there were anti-sectarian slogans. These are two of my favorites. The one on your left is from the Syrian uprising. It says, neither Salafi nor Muslim brother, my sect is freedom. So not only is this not sectarian, it's explicitly anti-sectarian. In Bahrain, on your right, you have this wonderful uh, poster. Uh, this is a son and his mother that say, we demand a real constitutional monarchy. Sunni and Shi'i are brothers. We all love our Bahrain. This is from the Bahraini uprising. And look at how mild these demands are. They're not even calling for a revolution or an overthrow of the regime. They're calling for a constitutional monarchy. Sunni and Shi'i together. Now, what was the response? And let me say one more thing about this. If you look at the sociological composition of the actual protesters who were in the streets in Syria, in Bahrain, let's take Syria, for example. The Assad regime claimed that this was a Sunni uprising, a terrorist conspiracy inspired by foreign plots against the Syrian state. Absolute and total rubbish. The actual composition of the Syrian uprising, of course there were Sunnis involved in the uprising, because Syria is a majority Sunni society, demographically speaking. So of course there were Sunnis. But they weren't calling for a Sunni revolution. They were calling for democratic rights and an end to this torture state that they lived under for 40 years. There were also Christians in, those, in the streets. There were members of the Alawi sect, Assad, the Assad family's own sect, very prominent Alawis uh, who were in the streets. There were members of the Druze sect, one of whom is in the audience today, if I'm not mistaken. Sara Hunaivi is a Druze Syrian who was herself in the streets protesting against the Assad regime. There were Ismailis, there were Kurds, there were Armenians, there were Christians, there were atheists and feminists and liberals and secularists. It was a cross-section of Syrian society. This notion that it was a Sunni uprising or a sectarian plot is absolute and total propaganda. The, what, the, what the regimes did in the face of these uprisings in 2011 was twofold. It took out the tanks and the guns and started shooting people, okay? I often say, if you want to understand the Assad regime's response to the 2011 uprising, you can sum it up in two words, live ammunition. And the people they were shooting and dragging into their torture chambers and dungeons were the most peaceful, non-sectarian elements of the entire society. Okay, What you ended up with was what the scholar Gilbert Ashkar calls the preferred enemy. You, un you get rid of the peaceful activists who are not sectarian, who are not calling for sectarian violence. You get rid of them, you shoot them, you torture them, you disappear them. And then you unleash jihadis from your jails. That's exactly what Assad did. He unleashed all these jihadis who had been useful to him in Iraq during the, during the US occupation. That's another story we can talk about. He puts them out into the streets of Syria and he says, you see, it's a sectarian jihadi extremist uprising. Self-fulfilling prophecy, okay? Utterly in bad faith, a total manipulation, but this is exactly how he responded. And also with the sectarian narrative, both violence and propaganda. Same thing in Bahrain. The Bahraini regime, which is a minority Sunni regime, allied a monarchy, allied with Saudi Arabia, majority Shia population. But again, the uprising wasn't to do with Shiism. It was Sunni, Shi'i demanding very mild reforms that were cross-cutting. But the, what does the Bahraini regime say about the uprising? 
It's an Iranian plot. It's a Shia plot against the, uh, the state of Bahrain, and we have to protect you. These are, this is what uh, some scholars call the securitization of politics. So in other words, in other, in, instead of dealing with the actual demands as policy questions, okay, you want different economic policies, you want more democratic rights, you want more civil liberties, instead of negotiating that, instead of sitting down at the table, you bring out the tanks, you deal with it as a security threat, you construct it as a, an existential threat inspired by foreign plots. This is what the scholar Madawi al-Rashid calls sectarianism as counter-revolution. And in her chap, that's the title of her chapter in our book, Sectarianization, and she looks at how Saudi Arabia constructed both its own internal Shia population, about 10 to 15 percent of the Saudi population is Shia, mostly located in the oil-rich east, strategically significant oil-rich east. Saudi, the Saudi regime is very insecure about that, especially in light of the, you know, the so-called Shia crescent. But Saudi Arabia also freaks out about the more region-wide aspects. All of these popular uprisings are freaking out the monarchies. It's not about sectarianism. It's not about Shia versus Sunni. It's about popular mobilization versus ruling elites and monarchies. This is what the scholar Jean-Pierre Filiou calls um, the Arab counter-revolution in his book From Deep, Deep State to Islamic State. The, Fr the original French version I like even better, which the English translation would be generals, gangsters, and jihadists. That's kind of, I just think that's a great title, and it says so much. Now, I'm going to end with this. The most catastrophic... Okay, let me back up. Saudi Arabia and Iran are engaged in this regional rivalry, this Cold War, this war of position between the two major hegemons of the region. And they're operating principally, it's a region-wide struggle, but they're, they, each of them has their own respective, I would say, Prime, primary theater of operations. For Saudi Arabia, it's Yemen. In 2015, it assembled this bogus so-called coalition. It's basically Saudi Arabia and its little partner in crime, the United Arab Emirates, a very nasty state which gets a very clean bill of health and a lot of cheering in the West from the Davos types who think it's, you know, Dubai is this great capitalist uh, you know, casino where people are free, you know, there's all this economic activity. The fact is the United Arab Emirates is a deeply repressive little monarchy which is participating in war crimes in Yemen. So that's the Saudi op theater of operations. The Iranian theater of operations is primarily Iran, is primarily Syria. Now what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen is absolutely unspeakable. Um, I, 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 don't, I can't, don't, I don't have time to go through all of it, but let's just Let's just hit the highlights. On a weekly basis, Saudi Arabia, since 2015, has been bombing hospitals, factories, schools, residential buildings, um, weddings, funerals, and just this summer in August, it bombed a bus full of school children. This is a photo taken from a YouTube video of the last few moments of life for these children that were on their way back from a summer camp uh, student program. You've probably heard the story about this. That bomb that blew up that bus, and here are its ruins, that bomb came from the United States. And that's something I'd like to talk about in the Q&A. This is, again, why the International Crisis Group emphasizes this is a U.S.-Saudi-Iranian Rivalry. The United States is not a neutral partner in this conflict. It is decidedly on the side of Saudi Arabia and is complicit in these war crimes. According to Save the Children, 85,000 children in Yemen may have already died of starvation. This is not a, famine, a, a, a natural disaster. This is not a famine that just happened. This is the direct and predictable result of the Saudi Emirati naval blockade of the port of Hodeida, which is where approximately 80% of all the food in Yemen gets through, and it's been, it's been stopped from getting through. Mind you, Yemen was already the poorest country in the Arab world before this conflict started. 
Yemen was the poor, on the human development index, Yemen was already off the charts in terms of poverty, malnutrition, underdevelopment. And now it's been bombarded into this absolutely unbearable state of affairs. And according to the United Nations, uh, we could be looking at the world's worst famine in 100 years if this war continues. Now, for its part, Iran is up to some very nasty stuff in Syria. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but let's just say that when you think of foreign fighters in Syria, what comes to mind? ISIS, Al-Qaeda, these transnational jihadis I was talking about, right? Who happen to be mostly Sunni. There's another jihad, transnational jihad in Syria, orchestrated by the Islamic Republic of Iran, and it's the Shia Jihad. Iran has assembled a massive transnational force from its own, op, basically commanded by the Al-Quds Brigade, headed by Qasem Soleimani, but it involves, of course, Lebanese Hezbollah, which has its own more direct reasons for intervening in the Syrian theater, but is ultimately under the general command of the Islamic Republic. You have Iraqi Shiite militias all over Syria. Iran has also recruited um, Shia mercenaries from Pakistan and Afghanistan. So you now have Shia fighters from six different countries on the ground fighting and committing atrocities in Syria. Hezbollah has turned it, it, most people think of Hezbollah as a, some sort of resistance force against Israel and Israeli aggression in Lebanon, right? That's what it used to be back in 2006 when Nasrallah and Ahmadinejad were popular in the Arab world. Hezbollah has essentially transformed itself into a death squad for the Assad regime in Lebanon. That's its primary function in the world today. And I'll just say this, Iran often gets a pass on Syria because it claims that it's fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Well, that's part of the story, but again, that's a case of writing history, reading history backwards. It's a very convenient narrative for the Iranian regime and its local and its regional allies to advance. The fact is, think back to 2011 when I mentioned that the, the Syrian uprising was non-sectarian, non-jihadi, cross-section of Syrian society, non-violent, making demands that were universal, democratic rights, etc. And the Assad regime opens fire on crowds of demonstrators. On which side of that conflict was the Islamic Republic of Iran then? Was it on the side of the protesters, peacefully demanding their rights? No, it was on the side of this brutal, murderous regime that was shooting unarmed civilians and torturing and disappearing peaceful demonstrators. Okay, so Iran has rewritten its history in Syria to make us think that it's on the side of the angels fighting terrorists, fighting al-Qaeda, fighting ISIS. That's a very convenient narrative, and if I were an Iranian apparatchik, I would make that argument too. The problem is that it belies the real history of the Syrian conflict, and the sectarianization of the Syrian conflict is something that Iran has had a huge hand in itself. It is also now, Iran, engaged in really ugly sectarian social engineering, orchestrating population transfers throughout uh, various provinces of Syria, scrambling the entire demographic landscape of Syria to make it more Shia and less Sunni. Now, this brings us to our present predicament with this, the, this truly bizarro world moment in Riyadh. This was actually Trump's first foreign visit as president, if you recall. And that's significant, that his first visit outside of the country as president was to Saudi Arabia for this um, love fest of dictators, tyrants, and monarchs, the people with whom he feels most comfortable and most at ease. And here they are in this kind of twilight zone moment um, uh, that, you know, it, you th I thought this was from The Onion when I first saw this. We, <laughs> we live in an age where now, it, you know, you have to check if the news is from The Onion or from The Washington Post. It could be from anything, right? Um, but this, re this was actually a, you know, something that we can all laugh about, but it was very real and it had very real consequences. 
within a few, let me just back up. What did Trump actually say? Beside, beside these bizarre photo op surreal moments, what did Trump actually say at that Riyadh summit? What he said was, all of the things you, Saudi Arabia, and your Sunni monarchy allies here in the Gulf, all of the things that you hated about Barack Obama, that he was on the side of the Iranians against you, that he made a fuss about your war crimes in Yemen, okay, that's all gone. We've got a new sheriff in town. I'm here now. I don't care about that stuff. I'm on your side. And I agree with you that the number one problem in the region is Iran and its, its expansionism. And I'm your ally, and that's the new story, okay? He completely shifted U.S. policy, ripping up the Iran nuclear deal a little bit after this, giving Saudi Arabia massive, massive weapons deals for its war in Yemen. Look at that big smile on MBS's face. And, base, and then he rips up the Iran nuclear deal, or withdraws the United States from the Iran nuclear deal which we can talk about in the Q&A. That's an incredibly important turning point in this story. It basically pivots the United States on a war footing um, against Iran in partnership with Saudi Arabia. And of course, now we have these guys running US foreign policy. Um, Pompeo and Bolton, who are not as you know in the headlines right now because the guy they work for sucks up most of the oxygen in the room, but Bolton for those of you who know his history, if the, for those of you who don't, Bolton is really a strange Lovian character. And I hesitate to say that because, um, you know, Dr. Strangelove was such a great movie and it was, it was kind of funny. There's nothing funny about this guy. Bolton is a truly menacing character who wants the United States to attack Iran militarily. He argued for it before, even before uh, he was national security advisor. It's one thing for him to be making noise on uh, Fox News uh, or from these right-wing think tanks. He is now the National Security, Ad Security Advisor of the United States. And all of this repositioning is leading towards war. Now, this is my concluding note. We are at a very interesting juncture. This is a crit we're at a crossroads here. Everything is up for grabs now. What I've been talking about is moving in the wrong direction. The way Trump has pivoted in the US-Saudi-Iranian rivalry towards Saudi Arabia, signing off, allying, and giving full unconditional support to these reactionary forces in the region, fueling and exacerbating the sectarianization process exactly when we need to de-escalate these tensions. However, with the murder, the brutal murder of uh, this journalist, Jamal Khashoggi, in Istanbul last month, we now have a situation where global opinion is shifting very dramatically, even within the U.S. Congress. Uh, it's, it, not only are we seeing that Saudi Arabia is basically a mafia state that engages in these sorts of acts against its internal critics and outside of its territory, but people are even re-examining the Yemen war. And this is really a critical, uh, a critical juncture and I will just say, actually, tomorrow is a national day of action on Yemen that several organizations have called. There are two very active pieces. I'm putting my, more of my activist hat on now and shifting from, more at, from analyst to activist. There are two critical pieces of legislation in the U.S. Congress right now. In the Senate, there's Resolution 54 that has been advanced by Bernie Sanders, Mike Lee, and Chris Murphy. There will be a vote on it this week, most likely. And I want to talk about that in the Q&A. And in the House, Ro Khanna and, uh, uh, and, and some of his colleagues have advanced H. Res 138. Both of these resolutions would call for, call for an end to U.S. support, military support for Saudi Arabia in its war crimes in Yemen. And we can talk about that more in the Q&A. This is my final slide, is just to give a shout out to some of the excellent organizations that are working on this uh, question of ending U.S. support for Saudi war crimes in Yemen. Voices for Creative Nonviolence, a, an international group headquartered right here in Chicago, and we have uh, one of its representatives, Sean Reynolds, right here in the front row, who will answer questions and has some handouts about some of the actions that Voices for Creative Nonviolence has coming up. So if you want to get involved in this issue, Win Without War, which is a national organization based in Washington, uh, is doing really important work on the Yemen issue. Just Foreign Policy, 
again, a national organization headquartered in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, and uh, the, the Yemen Peace Project, uh, which is a really excellent source of analysis and information. Uh, and uh, I highly recommend visiting the websites of all of these groups, and we have the good benefit of having a representative for, of uh, Voices for Creative Nonviolence here today. So with that, I will close, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Has there ever been an example of somebody trying to use uh, charity uh, similar to China's um, Silk Road initiatives, trying to use charity to influence foreign policy or gain people's loyalty? I'll build you a highway, I'll build you a port, I'll... Um, you mean in the region? Yes, in... in, in yeah. Yeah, I mean, both, you know, charity is, a, is one of the pillars of Islam. It's a very important, uh, at least it's, it's all of the states of the region profess uh, to be committed to charity, uh, especially the rich ones. But, um, you know, for example, Saudi Arabia sees a lot of its, you know, charity, if you will, uh, in the business of mosque construction, a truly uh, staggering percentage of new mosques that are created, uh, not only across the region, but in Europe and right here in the United States are funded by Saudi Arabia. And that sounds like something very nice, right? Especially in a war-torn region. Uh, but a price tag comes with that, which is that they also get to influence who the Imam is and what interpretation of Islam is promoted in that mosque. Um, there was a great article in the New York Times uh, about a year ago about um, Syrian refugees in Berlin who, uh, you know, went to this mosque uh, and they found the message completely alien to them, uh, utterly uh, dissonant and, and intolerant and puritanical, and they just stopped going to mosque. And and they uh, the, the 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 reporters found out that this was this was one of these Saudi funded mosques that was preaching Wahhabism, that's the the official Saudi uh, version of Islam, which is a highly puritanical, intolerant, repressive, uh, authoritarian version of Islam, and so a lot of what seems on the surface like charity, like constructing mosques for people, actually comes with a very serious price tag uh, and, and one that, in my opinion, actually poisons and makes things worse rather than better. Way, way back here. Way back. Yes. Here. Um, with the CIA coming out and saying how they believe that Mohammed bin, bin Salman did in fact order for the killing of the journalist, what happens now with U.S.-Saudi relations? Because the president says that he believes <laughs> Bin Salman when he says he didn't do it. So Right. Thank you for that question because it reminds me that I forgot to mention another important development. So the murder of Jamal Khashoggi in Istanbul, um, it, I think, has opened the doors for a total reconsideration uh, or recalibration of the U.S.-Saudi relationship, not only amongst activists, but even amongst foreign policy, uh, uh, foreign policy decision makers and uh, political elites and insiders. But the the other major factor is the midterm elections. So the Democrats are about to take over the House of Representatives, and this has all sorts of implications for what uh, U.S. policy with Saudi Arabia. Uh, might look like. I mean, ultimately, foreign policy is principally formed by the uh, the president and his foreign policy team and the State Department and so forth. But the uh, being able to cut off U.S. supply, the U.S. support for these war crimes um, has really been, I think, uh, helped quite a bit by the uh, brutal murder of Jamal Khashoggi and the pathetic really uh, circus-like way 
that the Saudis have tried to cover it up and that the uh, orange monster in uh, the White House also attempts to, you know, his, this is a joke. Like, you just turn on CNN, not even MSNBC, just turn on CNN and listen to any, any pundit, any mainstream, centrist, even conservative pundits are saying, this is, this is embarrassing. This, he talks about America first. This is Saudi first foreign policy. He's willing to bend over backwards to accommodate the most transparently uh, ridiculous claims of, of the Saudi regime where even our own CIA, it's very clear to everyone that this was an inside job, that the, the MBS ordered it. So the fact that Trump keeps denying it is actually only making it worse for him. I, I think that this is really a, a special moment where the U.S.-Saudi relationship is coming, at least in the media and policy debates, the relationship is coming under a kind of critical scrutiny that those of us in the more academic world have, and activist world have been urging for years and years, and now it's actually quite exciting to see it happening. Whether it will, what it will translate into on a policy basis, I'm not sure, but I highly urge everyone in this room to get involved with Voices for Creative Nonviolence and these other groups that are advancing this uh, legislation and, uh, and, have, and, uh, and, and, and mobilize around this issue because we really need to stop U.S. support for the Saudi war machine in Yemen. Okay, so I'm a lemonade from lemons kind of person. So we're, um, we're not stopping questions, except we're not having any more right now. Um, I'm going to do the little thing I have to do to end us officially by noon. And then I'm pretty sure I can tell Danny is going to be willing to stand around and talk to anybody who has more questions. So we're pausing questions. And you have to go away. Can I say one more thing? Oh, yes. Just one last thing is that Sean Reynolds from Voices for Creative Nonviolence has brought, can we give him a microphone for three seconds just to explain that he has these folders? Um, I think it's clear. I th he'll okay. be out here with his the material okay, afterwards. Yes. That'd be great. A sign-up sheet and also these, there are these actions coming up here in Chicago. There's a rally to oppose Saudi war crimes in Yemen and a speaker, a Yemeni-American scholar from Michigan State University will be coming to Loyola University to give a talk in a couple of weeks. And all of the information about that is at the little information table out there. And Sean and I will both be happy to discuss that over coffee. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm. Um, <laughs>